Welcome everyone to Cornerstone Baptist Church. We do welcome those joining us online. We wish you a Merry Christmas as we gather together to celebrate uh, our wonderful Savior and King, Jesus Christ. I invite you to take your Bibles and to turn to Luke chapter 7 this morning. Luke chapter 7. And uh, this uh, is probably not to most uh, a, a traditional uh, Christmas text. Um, and that's okay. Because we have a tendency to divorce things like the first coming of Christ from their greater significance with regards to uh, the redemptive story of Christ and the Scriptures. And so I've entitled the message this morning, Simply God's Love for Sinners. Uh, and last evening we looked at the birth of Christ and how it is all about God's redemptive work. Uh, in 1 John chapter 4, uh, we looked at verse 9 where it says, And this was manifested, the love of God toward us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. Here in His love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. You see, when we talk about the first coming of Christ, sometimes... Uh, I think there can be a tendency for God's people to somehow act as though Jesus is still uh, in a manger. He's not. In Revelation chapter 1, we get a picture of, of how Jesus is now. And remember, John the beloved disciple, when Jesus appeared to him, uh, revealing himself in Revelation 1, remember, he says, "...when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead." And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he which liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. We have to understand, that's how Jesus is now. Were he to appear in his glory here, we would all be prostrate before him. And we have to recognize that. And so it didn't end in a manger. This was the beginning concerning you and I, God's redemptive story. It, it took place and was launched in eternity past. It's always been in the mind of God. And so this morning we want to examine a text where last evening we were talking about uh, why Jesus came with regards to His saving work. Well, we want to look at Jesus specifically this morning in his love for sinners. And hopefully we can glean some lessons because I think there's some powerful lessons to be learned here. Under three headings this morning. Number one, the invitation. Verse 36, the invitation. It says, And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him, and he went down into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. So remember who the Pharisees were. The Pharisees were the religious conservatives. Uh, the Sadducees were the religious liberals. They denied the resurrection. They denied miracles. But the Pharisees affirmed those things. If you remember, there was a place in the book of Acts uh, where the Apostle Paul, as he was in this tribunal, perceived that there was a difference there were both Pharisees and Sadducees there, and he used that to his advantage. And he said, you know, he said, based upon the hope of the fathers, am I called into question? And it caused a little bit of a, a, a dissension there. Well, this Pharisee, Simon, does not appear to be a genuine seeker. Remember, the Pharisees were consistently trying to catch Jesus in his words. Uh, they didn't like Jesus. He was not popular with these. Uh, he was possibly here trying to entrap Jesus in some way. But yet, having said that, recognize that Jesus loved Simon. And out of his love, he accepts his invitation. It's important for us to recognize that the, see the Savior seeks and saves the self-righteous as well. These are not typically the people that we feel are in desperate need of God's grace. The self-righteous. Oh, they go to church. They may be at church this morning, at any number of churches. Uh, hopefully there's none here. But if there are, may the gospel confront you where you are in your self-righteousness. But the self-righteous, those that feel maybe their church attendance 
Maybe their Bible reading, their prayer, certainly their superior life of holiness is something of merit, right? Jesus loves the self-righteous as well. What do self-righteous people need? They need to understand their lost condition. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans chapters 1 through chapter 3, he deals with our lost condition, condemnation. You could take that one phrase under Romans 1 through 3. He shows in Romans chapter 1, verse 18 to the end, that all mankind lacks the righteousness of God. Chapter 2, verse 1 through 16, the moralist lacks the righteousness of God. Chapter 2, 17 through chapter 3, verse 9, the Jews lack the righteousness of God. We are all universally under the condemnation of God. In other words, we're in trouble. And the self-righteous people, they're blind to that. And what do they need? They need the law to chase them to the cross. Now we know that if righteousness could come by the law, Christ died in vain, according to Galatians 2.20. But it tells us in Galatians chapter 3 that the law is a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. And so they need that. So he has this invitation. And what an extraordinary time this is going to be. Notice, secondly, the interruption. Verses 37 through 39. Notice the interruption in verse 37 through 39. And recognize, one commentator said this was a curious custom of the day that allowed strangers to enter a house uninvited at a feast, especially beggars seeking a gift. And that would certainly stand to reason because we don't don't witness anybody stop this lady from what she's going to do. Well, notice in verse 37, it says, And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, uh, likely a prostitute. This was not uh, Mary Magdalene. This was uh, not Mary of Bethany. Uh, We're not told... Uh, who she is. We just know that she's a woman who came in. She was a sinner, it says. When she knew that Jesus said at meat in the Pharisee's house and brought an alabaster box of ointment, she came to the right person, didn't she? She was obviously, as we're going to see in our text, someone who recognized their lost condition. Indeed, sinners need to come to Jesus. If we look at the ministry of Christ, one of the things that characterizes Christ's ministry are those who were the marginalized of society that wanted to be with Jesus. You remember how he was, they accused him? They said, well, he eats with publicans and sinners, tax collectors and sinners. Those that nobody wanted to be around, there was Jesus. And so she came to the right person. Notice in verse 38, her sorrow and her sacrifice. This alabaster box of ointment, this flask would have been of great value And for somebody of her social status, this would have been quite a sacrifice. Verse 38, and stood at his feet behind him weeping. Remember, they would recline at table and their feet would be out. And so she couldn't get to the point of of anointing him properly. So she would be at his feet, stood at his feet behind him weeping, began to wash his feet with her tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head. She had no towel. This was something that should have taken place. Jesus points it out as he enters this man's house and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. What extraordinary uh, love and devotion she shows. She was broken, yet displayed such worship and gratitude to our Lord. You know what's amazing? She doesn't care about those that were there. Right? Sometimes... Worship has more to do with those who are around than the one we're worshiping. She didn't care about that, did she? She didn't care about the Pharisees. She didn't care what people thought. It seems as though she was just completely consumed with her love for Jesus Christ. Would to God that would be us, right? But far too often we're concerned with what others think. Because we all know on the day we're going to die, that's what really matters, right? That's what people think about, right? On your deathbed, you'll think, wish my neighbor would have thought more of me. No one thinks stuff like that. Wish I would have impressed more. No one thinks stuff like that. What matters on the day you're going to face Jesus Christ is what you've done with Jesus Christ. 
That's all that's going to matter. And you may find in this life, beloved, a good way to live and a code to live by, but you better make sure the code you live by is the one you want to die by. And there's only one code, and it's a capital C, Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, the life. And no man comes to the Father but by Him. What devotion. Well, what an extraordinary picture here. And how unlikely. A prostitute? Think about this. Do we see prostitutes? Do we see people that sin differently than us as potential worshipers of Jesus Christ? Do we? Remember what it says in John chapter 4? Remember the woman at the well? You remember what Jesus said? So he tells her, he says, well, go call your husband. And she says, well, I have none. He said, well, you've had five, and the one you're now with is not your husband. She was obviously somebody that struggled in relationships, right? And then I perceive you're a prophet, and the conversation goes on. But do you remember what he says this? He says, there's coming a time when people will worship in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeks such to worship Him. Why is God seeking people to worship Him? Because people were made to worship God. You see, everyone in this room, everyone watching, you're worshiping something. And you know what you're worshiping? Where you spend your time, your talents, your treasures. What commands your thinking is what you're worshiping or who you're worshiping. We're all worshiping someone or something. Someone says, well, I'm an atheist. You're worshiping yourself. You look at your God in the mirror every time you groom yourself. See, we're a world full of worship and worship. The word worship simply means what do you attribute worth to? And she was attributing worth to the only one who was worthy. Verse 39, Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner." Oh, Simon, what, a, what an astute Pharisee you are. If Jesus were only a prophet, you are dining, Simon, with the one who created you and to whom all the prophets pointed to. This brings up a good point. How do we view others? How do you view others? And I'm telling you, Pharisees, you know this and I know this, there is a danger that Pharisees uh, represent to God's people. Let me ask you this morning, beloved, how do you view people that sin differently than you? Because you sin and I sin. We all sin. We're all guilty of sin. And generally, we're more gracious to those that sin in the similitude after ourselves. But boy, what about those people? What's the problem in our country? And we've got a laundry list of types of sins that are the problem in our country. How do we view them? And what are we doing about it? (laughs) You know, we're great at at nailing down the problem. Well, the problem is this, the problem is that. I submit to you. We're going through the book of Acts in our Sunday morning messages. You remember what he says? You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses. We are ordained by God Almighty with the task of making disciples. We see the problems in our country. We see the problems in our world. We know the solution. You remember what Paul said, Romans chapter 1. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? It's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. It's all about the gospel. and It's about what we do with the gospel and how we interact with the world with the gospel. But if you and I fall into a pharisaical mindset, 
where we see the ills in our community, the ills in our nation, and we don't recognize that we have a responsibility as stewards of the gospel to take it to our communities and to our nation, then we are part of the problem in being disobedient and not bearing the gospel to these. How do we view others? We've got to be careful. Well, notice lastly the instruction. The instruction. Verse 40, And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he says, Master, say on. So, so Jesus is going to uh, reveal to him. Not only was he a prophet, he was the prophet, capital P. In, in Acts, what we're going to go through, we're going to see back in Deuteronomy, it says there's going to be a prophet who comes. And it's a messianic text talking about Jesus. And that's the one that we must hear. So he, he's going to tell a parable here. Verse 41, there was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? And Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave the most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. We, we, you know, it, it didn't take, uh, you might say it didn't take a rocket scientist to figure this one out, right? But Jesus is going to use this as a powerful lesson to this man concerning what has just transpired. Notice this powerful lesson. Notice first in verse 44 and uh, verse four, through verse 46, we see Simon's neglect and this woman's love and devotion. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon. So he's looking at her, speaking unto Simon. Simon, seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet. But she hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Again, this, these are courtesies that he's going to speak to that are shown to individuals who are guests in someone's house. Thou gavest me no kiss, a greeting, a common greeting, but this woman since the time I came in hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil, thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. This woman's faith and forgiveness are fully demonstrated here. Verse 47, Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. Now the woman's faith and forgiveness that she's experiencing are proven by her much love. He's not saying that, that it was her love that caused the forgiveness, but her love is the proof that she's experienced his forgiveness. Now, was Jesus saying here in verse 47, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much, but whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. Is, is he, is, he's not making a statement with regards to the fact that Simon's sins were small. He's not making that statement at all. He's talking about her experience and devotion based on her forgiveness. You see, she had what Simon did. She knew she was a sinful wretch. Simon didn't understand that he was. And so he was lost in his sin. When you go through the Gospels, notice how Jesus addresses the religious people of the day compared to the ones like this woman. His harshest words were for those that claimed to honor the law and honor God. How far from God they were. There's a place in the Gospels where Jesus says, judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. And we're always making judgments. We see people, we assume this person, well, they, might, they must be where they ought to be with God. And Simon, Simon certainly, if you were to see Simon in the streets, you might have thought Simon was a fairly squared away guy. She wasn't like this prostitute. <laughs> 
He wasn't like these tax collectors fleecing his brethren. He didn't see his lost condition, so he remained in his sin. Well, notice verses 48 through 50. Notice this proclamation. Verse 48, And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. What wonderful words. Do you know God's forgiveness this morning? And how often do you think about it? As God's people, we understand that. We understand it says he, He's put our sins as far as the east is from the west, and our sins and iniquities He'll remember no more. Tells us in Colossians chapter 2, He took away the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to His cross. He did those things. We're, we're forgiven. Romans 8, 1, There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. None. Amazing words. Thy sins are forgiven. Never lose the wonder of your salvation. Churches that do not hold forth, churches, Christians, parachurch, fill in the blank. When we take our eyes off of the cross and the redemptive work of Christ will be a breeding ground of Pharisees. We must never lose sight of the cross of Jesus Christ. Galatians is all about that. Why? Because there is a default to Christians to linger in a performance-driven life. And you remember what he says, Galatians 6.14, God forbid that I should glory... Save in what a wonderful Christian I am. Didn't say that. Save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Let us never lose sight of that. Look in verse 49. They're amazing. They that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? They understood this. They understood that only God could forgive sins. Exactly. He who was dining with them is God. John chapter 14. You remember there's a place where Jesus, He says, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Philip says, show us the Father and it sufficeth us. Do you remember what Jesus said? He says, have you been so long a time with me, Philip, and hast thou not known me? He that has seen me has seen the Father. Whew. Wow. John 8, he says, except ye believe that I am, you'll die in your sins. If you don't believe that I am, like, the, like I am who spoke to Moses, you'll die in your sins. Yes, only God for, can forgive sins. Uh, collection of Pharisees. That's exactly who's dining with you. Emmanuel, God with us. We'll look in verse 50. And he said to the woman, Thy faith hath saved thee. Go in peace. You are saved. Now, not everybody that encountered Jesus, even those who He had healed uh, temporally, there were those that He had opened the eyes of the blind. He had healed people that did not have genuine saving faith. Well, this woman, He declares, what a powerful declaration. Thy faith. You know, we say faith alone. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Do you realize what a rub this would be to a Pharisee? Do you remember the litany, the laundry list in, in Philippians chapter 3, uh, the resume, as it were, of the Apostle Paul? As touching the law, I'm blameless. I've done all these things. And then he comes down, what does he say? But what things were gain to me? Gain in what way? 
gain personally, gain in society and call, what things were gained to me, my religious resume, those things I counted loss for Christ. And he said, I doubtless count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. And then he goes on to say, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but the righteousness of God through faith. Romans chapter 4 says this, What shall we say then that Abraham our father is pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof the glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is a reward reckoned not of grace, or reckoned rather, not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. you got to understand in our mindset this doesn't seem fair. This doesn't seem equitable, but we have to understand salvation is not about what's fair. Do you know what we get if we get what's fair? We get hell if salvation is about what's fair. Salvation is about God's grace. Getting what we don't deserve. It's about mercy, not getting what we do deserve. Salvation is not something about God giving you what you've earned. What you and I have earned is condemnation, hell. Isaiah 64 says even our righteousness are as filthy rags. But Christ takes care of this. So this, this just doesn't compute. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is a man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Cometh this blessedness upon the circumcision only or upon the un uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. And he goes on down to talk about this. But we have to understand, it. what did he say? Thy faith has saved me. Never forget that. Remind yourself daily, by grace you're saved through faith. Next time you see somebody and you think, <laughs> what's that guy doing over there? Think to yourself, by grace I am saved through faith. And you could even remind yourself of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. He's chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise and the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. We're the foolish things, okay? Remind yourself that. Why? Because gospel living is all about gospel preaching to oneself. Reminding myself I'm no different than that person. That person who's in the gutter most, I'm no different but the grace of God. I didn't choose my parents. I didn't choose my country of origin. I didn't choose any of those things. These are all by God's grace, and certainly salvation, the greatest of all blessings, all by God's grace. Never forget that. God's people, beloved, are always in danger of the peril of performance-driven living. What does that produce? It leads to pride and a critical spirit of others. Well, others just don't know. If you start sentences, others should know. If you, be careful. Be careful. So if it's not performance driven, by the way, am I saying that this woman, and this, is, this, this right here is a straw man argument. When you talk about being saved by faith, okay, people are like, oh, well, you just think you ought to just live anyway. Oh, yeah, I said that, didn't I? I didn't say that. You're telling me the woman here who showed an act of worship that quite frankly myself nor anyone here has ever done, that this woman walked out of the presence of Jesus determined to go live a sinful life? I don't see that at all. I don't see that at all. That's not what saving faith produces. You may have met somebody who has faith. It says in James chapter 2, the devils also believe and tremble. But will you not know that faith without works is dead? Where there's genuine saving faith, where there's root, there's fruit. And those are works that testify to the glory of God. So it's not performance-driven living, it's faith living. What does that produce? What is faith living? It's Galatians 2.20. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. 
And the life which I now live in the flesh, how do I live it? By the faith of the one who loved me and gave himself for me. What does that produce? It produces humility because it's always looking to the cross. And beloved, we have no boast but God. That's our only boast. You know, we come, we celebrate Christmas, right? Christmas is all about God seeking and saving the lost for His glory. So what are some life points here this morning as we wrap up? What are some life points? We have four. Notice number one. God's pursuit of sinners is relentless. He is both seeking the self-righteous, he's seeking the sinful. Both are being pursued. The parable of, of the prodigal son is really the parable of two prodigal sons. The oldest son was lost in his goodness, and the younger son was lost in his badness. You, you know, oftentimes people, they'll say things like this, I wonder what God's up to. You know what he's up to? Seeking and saving the lost. Uh, John chapter 5, Jesus says, My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. He's always working. His redemptive work is at the heart of what He's doing. Isn't it nice to know that we're going to go home? Some of you have, you know, you're hoping that I finish this quickly because your roast or whatever is going to burn. I I don't know. Isn't it nice to know we'll go home, we'll, we'll enjoy family, Uh, we'll start the work week. And we may not give too much thought to the lost people that we work with, that we're around. But aren't you glad that God Almighty is relentless in pursuing those lost people? Because some of those lost people are your children. Some of them are your friends. Some of them are your parents, your grandparents. They're lost in sin. They're lost in self-righteousness. And God's relentlessly pursuing them. Isn't that great to know? He that keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. He's always about His work. Secondly, the Word of God provides an accurate view of ourselves and others. God's Word, beloved, confronts our pride. It brings us to the cross. It sets our path in humility that we might have the grace we need to be useful to Him. Spend time in the Word of God. Immerse yourselves in the Word of God. Let God confront your heart. Let it confront your attitudes. Why? Because we don't want anything in our lives to to keep someone from seeing Jesus Christ on display in our lives. No hang-ups. Nothing should keep others from seeing Christ in our lives. Number three, worship and devotion are all about love. Let me encourage you this morning, compare your worship and devotion with this woman's. As I was studying this text, I was just amazed. What abandon, what complete abandonment of self. She didn't care who was around. Do you understand? Understand, it wasn't that Jesus had just been to a spa. And just had his feet in a pedicure. Okay, this is what a house slave did. And she did it with herself. This is whole devotion. Is that your worship? Is that my worship? This ought to convict us. Oh, she's nothing but a prostitute. Boy, she got this thing of worship down, doesn't she? What love. See, that's what it comes down to. You remember when Jesus asked Peter... Peter, lovest thou me more than these? Ask that question the next time you're in temptation. Ask that question next time you have a thought you shouldn't have or you're doing something you shouldn't do. Do I love you, Jesus, more than these? Ask yourself that question. And may God be pleased to cause you and me to worship like a prostitute long ago who's immortalized in His Holy Word. It's all about love. And when we truly grasp God's grace, she did. Our problem is we don't so often. And then lastly, beloved, Jesus is worthy. Give Him your all. What are you holding back this morning? What are we holding back? I know this isn't a typical Christmas message. 
That's okay. <laughs> it's a Bible message. <laughs> and we're going to stick to word, the Word of God. We're going to hold Jesus forth like we want to, right? He's worthy. Give Him your all. What are you holding back? Your children? Your job? Your relationships? What is it? If there were one, if I were to ask you this morning, you don't, don't answer, please. God knows your heart. Is there one thing in your life that you say, you know what, it's mine, and I won't give this up. You see, you think about that. It's all about Him. He is worthy. And we got to give Him our all. And you know when we got to do it? Daily. Because <laughs> if you're like me, I'll lay it down, and then I'll pick some stuff up. <laughs> right? That's what we do. But I want to encourage you, make it a daily discipline, beloved, to just give Him everything. Wake up in the morning, say, it's all yours. And during the day, you'll see how he is, he is working. And your temptation will be to take it back. I don't know what God's up to here. How could this happen? Wait a minute. Do you remember in the morning you said, God, it's all yours. Let me live that way today. May God be pleased to help us to be those worshipers. On a day that we celebrate the first coming of Christ, may we live our lives wholly for His glory, both now and forevermore. Let's go to him in prayer this morning. Father, we, we thank you that as we come together to celebrate, uh, to celebrate the birth of Christ, we celebrate not just the birth of our Savior. We celebrate him. And God, we rejoice in this amazing grace We're challenged by this, this woman in our text. And I pray, God, that we would learn, that we would glean. And I pray in our very heart of hearts that our soul's desire would be to you and to you alone. Thank you for all the blessings that you lavish upon us for that amazing grace which we enjoy. We rejoice and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're joining us at home, may God bless you. And if you have never entered into a relationship with Jesus Christ, yield yourself to Him today. The Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Trust Him today. Have a great week.